uh, greeting to everyone. Um, first of all, before I say anything, it's a pleasure to meet this great oracle. Um, I didn't know who you were, but now I get to see the face. So, so please. Um, in honor to what I've been doing in the classroom setting, I just want to share with you that I just changed the title when I heard Gary mention that Dr. Poppert's dream might die. I don't think that's possible. Then I wouldn't be here. Um, 1984, I came to the United States of America at the age of 12. I didn't speak one word of English. I walked in a classroom setting where I saw an apple to eat. And they put this logo CD inside. I didn't speak a word of English. At that very moment, I said to myself, this is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. I learned coding. I, I mastered the logo program. At least I thought I did. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I knew what I wanted to do. So the idea is, uh, it's not a pipe dream. It's Popper's dream. And, I, and we're not far from this. Actually, this is ready here. Um, for those of us who keep up with what's happening at the bleeding edge of where education is moving. So uh, can I get the next slide? All right, this is uh, Mr. Newman here. I, to you guys, is Mr. Newman. That's George. That's my friend. And um, <clears throat> to me, when I think of him, I think of another Newman, Johnny Von Newman, which uh, every computer system, 32-bit uh, architecture is based on his work. Without that work, those of you, I'm sure most of you here know, we would not even be here. So that's another story. Uh, we could get into that, but let's move forward. All right. Um, I titled this Voices from the Field. And the way I look at education, it's a battlefield. Because where I work, there are kids there, as far as social economic level, just kids that are below poverty level. When you step in the classroom setting, you have to play so many roles as an educator, teacher, father, friend. Uh, it's just so many, and there's so many hats to wear. Sometimes you just have to ask yourself, or you, why are you doing this? What's the purpose of this? And, and I consider ourselves true soldiers. We were four stars on our ship, left or right arm, but uh, it's okay. We don't need to be recognized by the world as long as a few understand who we are. And that's what Patrick's represent, because I'm here to uh, tested what he has done. So I'm one of his products. Uh, next slide. Okay, in regards to this Rhino business and this project, <clears throat> I want you guys to think of it this way. Name one game in the world where you have an actual crisis. Where right now in Africa, this black rhino is on the critically endangered species list. We are literally in the 21st century, witnessing the destruction of one of the most honorable species on earth. But yet we somehow believe that nothing can be done about it. But not my kids, because they will save the rhino. And I will show you how we'll do it. All right, uh, this is just the background. Next slide. All right, in regards to um, statistics, so, so you can look at the dreadfulness of these numbers, uh, this is practically where we are. This is coming from Tanzania, which is one of the places where you have the largest population of black rhino. Actually, this 3,000 figure that's left is probably less than that at this point. And the western black rhino has been uh, declared extinct in South Africa. It was just all over the blocks. So it's happening. <clears throat> um, uh, next slide. So this is, again, these work, uh, this kind of stuff here. We have a blog where the kids uh, actually or engage, they create their own dynamic community, they collect all this data, all this information, and bring a sense of awareness to children all over the world. And we will have an impact on these rhinos. So this is just to give you an idea of what's actually happening. The numbers, again, you know, we live in a dynamic system now. Everything changed on a daily basis. So I, I practically think it's getting worse. Uh, but this is just some numbers for you. Uh, next slide. All right. Now, let's get back to open. What is open all about? What is George trying to do here? 
Well, the problem we have in education is very simple. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious problem uh, in the higher PhD academic level. It's, 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 a, it's a house that th there's a buffer region between what the PhDs and the researchers are doing at MIT or Harvard and what's actually happening in the battlefield. So how do you get across this interface? Well, you need someone who's actually in the field. You have to have someone who understand the curriculum issues, pedagogical issues, and all this nonsense, and actually understand <clears throat> what is changing. What I was able to do with George, I was able to take his game platform and say, wait a minute, man, let me look at the, the New York City uh, science standards. These are the standards that uh, are in alignment with the unit of study that the game address. So, you know, I just plug it out and I, so we could have some rigor uh, to showcase what we're trying to do. All right, so I did, I helped them to come up with, uh, in other words, to bring it up to standards. Now we have the uh, NGSS, which is the National Science Standards, Next Generation. So all the, uh, the game system itself, we're gonna find a way, it's pretty simple to plug the standards within, but that's not our major concern. The standards get thought through the process of teaching. Uh, next, now you're gonna actually see real learning artifacts, okay? The kids in the lab, what they do, they come in, you cannot unplug them from these computers. Once they log in, they enter these virtual platforms. Uh, this is where the learning happens. So I'm gonna walk you through one example of what the kids are actually able to do. This here, on the game uh, unit, this is, uh, we have a little notebook where the kids, when they engage in the game, they use it to uh, capture background information so that they are able to proceed through the game. But I'm gonna show you how I use that information to uh, assess their deep understanding. This is just one example. Please, uh, next slide. Uh, one more, this is another book. Okay, so prior to the game, what we do is just the Prius thing, like, okay, let's see what you, what do you know about, uh, whatever, uh, game reserve and, uh, they actually thought at first, this is a video game you play, uh, whatever, but they, <laughs> endangered species, uh, how humans uh, uh, affect their habitat. So you kind of get a sense of what they know, what they would like to know. Through a lot of uh, scaffolding and guidance, uh, they tend to uh, be able to make sense out of this. Uh, this one is a, I use this one because this kid kind of really had an idea after, because she's a lot of scribbled, and she, she kind of get an idea what she wanted to do. Next slide, I just want to walk you through it. Now, here in the game system, what the kids have to do, as they play the game, we create these scaffolds for them where, and this is where the, the critical thinking stuff come in, they have to, as they log in the world, and it's all textual data, uh, information they have to collect, they have to collect this information, the grass area, how much food is produced, uh, water is produced, okay, and things of that nature. And then based on that data, they should be able to determine Okay, first of all, in each habitat, okay, which animal should go in their habitat? So you have the grass habitat, water habitat, shrub, uh, and, and the tree. So based on the actual data they collect in the game, they're learning about what is the habitat, uh, what is the niche, what is the community, what is the population. If I try to go up there, uh, carry on like I'm giving a lecture with a book in my hand, the kids throwing pencils, rocks, whatever they can grab, look, the world has changed. <laughs> kids don't learn the same way. I think what happened right now in education, <clears throat> education has left most educators a thousand years behind, if not more. Because to really understand what's happening, you have to not be from here. You have to be outside of the world to understand what's happening in the world. You see, so in a sense, we have a serious problem in our hand. And there's a solution, there's a way around it. So let's move on. So uh, here again in the game system, they collect their data, they go into this virtual village, uh, which is actually a real place in Tanzania. And again, I'm bringing a connection. This is something that's happening in the real world. The kids log into a virtual platform and they're able to collect this data, critical thinking skill, higher order thinking skill, problem solving skill, all you name it, they're getting that from this. Next, and this is the actual work. This is, uh, you can see, it, it, it's, this is where the learning happened. And at times, let me just tell you how my classroom is. Uh, Gary was mentioning um, that this whole maker movement. If you walk into my lab, it's a zoo. It's organized chaos. 
And that's what learning should be. Uh, teachers, the problem we have is, is very simple. And it's at all level of, of education. We're afraid to let kids learn. Somehow we think we know what the zone of proximal development is. Do we really? Last time I checked, the mind is still a mystery. We might understand the genomic code, but then we have a long way to go. Okay? I just want to show you a few more things. Next. Uh, next one. Okay, this here in regards to reflection, um, you mentioned Papert's one of his main uh, thing was with student reflection, which is so critical to any system. Uh, George's game system, reflection is the heart, because when the kids actually engage in these activities, they have to now show what they know. And we use this piece to collect uh, textual data and to see if they really understand what they're doing. And we create a system where I'm, pre I'm pretend I'm Habib, I'm this mystical character in Tanzania. They actually think they're writing to Habib, but I'm the one reading their paper. <laughs> so to show you that so many different levels of how the game is so interesting. Next, uh, that's part of the same thing. Next, all right. Uh, this part is just a research-based thing. Uh, in regards to myself, I am a doctoral student. I'm at a program at uh, Pace University. Uh, it's designed uh, to, to get educators. It's called Doctorate of Professional Study. This, to get real teachers in the battlefield to go back to school, uh, get a doctorate, and go and, and show what education is really all about. You know, you, 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 in order to teach, man, you have to teach. You, you can't do it like that. You cannot be a four-star general in a bunker and understand the battlefield. You're fooling yourself. You can't do it like that. You have to teach. That's the only way I see. All right, next slide. Okay, now we're dealing with the ocean. This is it. Life started there after uh, George Rock hit the planet somehow. Uh, <laughs> but this is it. I have... A unit I, I designed, because uh, I, I teach fifth grade students a unit on ecosystem. Every year I run into the same problem. I take out the book. Guys, follow with the books. Psh, I don't care. I don't want to hear that stuff. So I said, Jesus Christ, this is crazy. I have to find a way out of this mess. So what I did, I created a unit online called a dynamic ecosystem, where every kid have a particular ecosystem they're studying. So what ended up happening is you got a kid working on rainforest, tiger, uh, desert, each one of them have a particular ecosystem they focus on. So that particular kid or group, two of or three of them, they become an expert at that particular system using the wiki space. We throw everything up there and they have their projects that they engage in, their real art, learning artifacts. So that kid become an expert in a uh, 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 tiger ecosystem. When they show their presentation, then they share their ideas and everything is online and they piggyback off each other. Then before you know it, you have a buzzing classroom, a network where everybody's feeding off of each other. That's practically what has to happen. Uh, the teachers can do it, um, but if we show them how, there's a way around it. Uh, next, let me show you one more thing. <clears throat> and I have something to say about this slide. Um, <clears throat> George and I, I can speak, and Danny also, and a bunch of other people, Sandra also, we're not from here. And all those phenomenal uh, seers I've met, people who are just visiting. Now, why is this slide? Well, this is, I caught, I think Joy forwarded me this thing here. I, I, I went to look through it. And I had one of my third grade students say, oh, Mr. Reynolds, I was just using, I was just up there yesterday. This is fascinating, ain't it? She said, well, how long do you think we might be able to, to, to go there? I said, well, uh, he said, well, we already know the escape velocity. Why can't we just go? I, I said, well, we don't. We can travel at the speed of light. What seems to be the problem, Mr. Nellis? He says, is it that we, he said, well, I think I, I know what the problem might be. Is it that any material we make now, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to withstand that speed, it would melt? I said, well, yeah, I guess you're on the right track here. So what can we do about that? He said, well, the synthetic chemists have to come up with something. This kid is in third grade. <laughs> yeah, I have another kid, another student, this was really crazy. I, I don't have my computer screen here to show you. On my uh, computer, when you come to the next room, I'll show you. I have uh, one of my greatest scientists. I'm almost done. I need three more minutes. One, I'm glad. One. We're getting done here. <clears throat> okay, one more. I'm glad Dr. Popper, 
might be forgotten. I'm going to tell you why. So did Maxwell. James Clerk Maxwell came with electrodynamic theory, a dynamical understanding of, of his work. I mean, even scientists who knows science, they don't give Maxwell the credit he deserves. He's still shrouded in mystery. I have a fifth grade student, George met him. Daniel. Danny, uh, Daniel. He read Maxwell's work, a, a dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field, in fifth grade. He ran through Einstein's work in one week. He said, and he thought one time his teacher called me, uh, he was in kindergarten. She, he called me and said, Mr. Reynolds, you got to speak to this kid. This kid's gone. I said, what, what's going on? I went to him and he said, you know what, Mr. He said, Mr. Reynolds, um, Einstein is wrong. He, you know, he's off by a few factors because space is not flat. The, the, his calculation on the, on the field, gravitational fields are not correct. He said, I can prove it. I said, okay. Uh, I said, Daniel, have you read Einstein's work? He said, I don't have anything. So I went home. I, I had a couple of books, small books. I, I gave him a book uh, for like seventh grade level. He came back the next day. He said, well, that, was, that was okay, but uh, you have anything else you, you can show me? I just kept giving him the books that I have. I ran out of books. I, 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 uh, when I got to Norbert Wiener's book, I give him Claude Shannon stuff on the uh, mathematical theory of communication. He ran through it. Uh, I, he just ran through everything. So this zone of proximal, the proximal the ZPD thing we're talking about. And the last thing I'm going to leave you all with is this. As far as trying to put a cap, and this is where the mistake happened, I think. Somehow we think we know what the kids' limits are. And I, I don't think there are any limits. Think about what I'm saying. Educators, the, the fear we have, teachers, all of them, is that we think we know what they should learn. Uh, this kid by third grade, he should be able to do this and that. I know P.I. just started that, but that's not what this is all about. And that's what Papert was trying to reach at. He understood somehow if he could just go back. That's why every time he passed near a store, he had to go in there, because somehow if he just stay in that <laughs> world, he just would understand the magic of how it happens. And I'm just starting to begin to scratch the surface as to what that is. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you.